I will tell you a little bit about myself. I wanted to become a teacher uh, as I was growing up. And then I looked at what teachers did and I said, that's way too much work. So I became a doctor. <laughs> and, and then as I was learning medicine, I also learned that doctor means teacher in Latin. So I felt much better about that decision. So I am going to talk to you about Rett syndrome. And Rett syndrome, uh, probably most of you have not heard of Rett syndrome. If you have, it may be because it used to be in the autism spectrum, and it actually no longer is. Uh, but if you had heard about Rett syndrome, you would immediately think, my goodness, what a horrible condition that is to have. Uh, so you might be a little surprised that the title of my talk is A Beacon of Hope. So the two kids on the left here have a classic Rett syndrome. And you can see just by looking at them some of the things that that involves. Uh, this child cannot walk. She has her hands tightly clenched in the middle. She, if she were moving, you would see that she's doing repetitive hand movements. She can't use her hands. Neither of these kids can talk. Uh, they use facial expression, some of them relatively well, and eye gaze for communication, and that's their sole means of communication. About half of the kids can walk, but they walk funny, uh, and uh, they could still get around. The girl on the right, however, has just finished her cheerleading practice. Uh, her mom is a cheerleader, so she's in a cheerleading group. But she uh, developed, I'll tell you a little bit more about her development, but she developed with some bumps, but now she has some behavioral problems, and that's really it. She can read and write at grade level, she goes to regular school, she walks fine, obviously, she can use her hands, etc. cetera. Uh, they all have the same mutation in the same gene. So, Whatever it is about this particular gene, it's a complicated gene, that can make uh, these kids so profoundly affected, and this child over here, somewhat mildly affected, leads us to believe that if we find a way to, uh, to modify the gene in some way, or to modify other aspects of, of the downstream products of the gene, we can turn these kids into this child. And effectively, parents would think that that was a cure, a definitive cure for the disorder, if we were able to do that. This guy, Andreas Rett, in the 50s, uh, was in his office. He was a developmental pediatrician in Vienna. Saw thousands and thousands of kid with kids with developmental disability in Vienna. And he noticed one day in his office two little girls, very small, who looked very similar. They were sitting there, wringing their hands, couldn't talk. And he turned to his nurse and he said, nurse, uh, these two kids, you know, they're unrelated. They must have the same genetic syndrome, though. And his nurse said, well, Dr. Rett, you have six other children in your clinic who also do that. Uh, would you like me to pull their records? So it's debatable whether he, Rett discovered the disorder or his nurse. But uh, he wrote about it in German went around Europe with videos and showed them to pediatricians and neurologists, and they all thought he was nuts. And that, he published his first paper in 1966, and it wasn't until this guy, Bengt Hagberg in Sweden, uh, published his paper in 1983 that the disorder became publicly recognized. So Bengt Hogberg's tack was a little different. Uh, if there are any physicians in the audience, this will resonate with you. Whenever he saw an interesting child, he would take their, their file and he would put it in a cardboard box. And he had a special box for the kids that he was noticing through the 50s, 60s, and 70s who would wring their hands and they were all girls and you know they had this particular pattern. And, uh, Eventually, he put all of this together, and with the help of another neurologist, Jean Icardi, they went back and they found Rett's original paper. And in uh, what I think is a unique gesture of humility in medicine, they named the disorder Rett syndrome, uh, even though, you know, of course, Rett had uh, not been able to publicize it. So, what is Rett syndrome? <clears throat> well, the key component here is that it's a neurodevelopmental disorder. As I've been talking about it with folks around here, people have said things like, well, is it like Tay-Sachs? No, it's absolutely not like Tay-Sachs. These kids lose skills, but then they plateau and they often uh, increase in, a, in, in their development. And uh, not unlike autism, 
they, um, they have a developmental problem that is not a degenerative problem. So the four core features are that they, they're basically born normally and they develop normally up until they're about one to two years of age. Uh, they develop hand use, they can feed themselves, they may be a little delayed, but it's usually not profound. They develop some language, several words, maybe two word sentences, many of them learn to walk, and then they lose all of that and they develop these repetitive hand movements. And uh, it's debatable whether the hand movements are sort of preoccupying them, but that's the pattern that we see at that period. They become socially withdrawn at that age, one and a half to two years. But then after that regression period, they come out on the other side and they plateau. They become very socially engaged. I'll show you some other pictures. But this little girl uh, over here on, on the right, nobody would say that she's socially withdrawn. She's come up to me of her own volition, and now she's engaging me and smiling. Uh, she can't use her hands. She can't talk. She can walk again, but she walks funny. So. After these folks up here, let's see if I can, yeah. After these folks uh, effectively described the disorder, Alan Percy, who I studied under in 1983, was the first person in the United States to diagnose someone with Rett syndrome. Uh, he then recruited this person, Huda Zogby, uh, who was at the time a younger uh, neurologist, interested in the genetics of the disorder, and she helped to identify the gene responsible for the disorder. It took them 16 years, but they identified finally that a single gene was responsible for at least 95% of individuals who exhibit this pattern of symptoms known as Rett syndrome. Alan Percy then went on in 2003 to recruit a whole bunch of other people and create what's called a natural history study where they studied in detail all of the features of the disorder so that we could understand the pattern uh, uh, better. I became involved in 2006 with the help of the International Rett Syndrome Foundation, which is now rettsyndrome.org, uh, and studied under all of these individuals. So <clears throat> why am I up here talking to you about Rett Syndrome, and why should you be interested? Well, among rare diseases, it is a common rare disease. Now, that might sound silly, but if you think about rare diseases, it's estimated that about one in 20 individuals in the world has some sort of rare disease. If you add all of them up, there are thousands of them. For Rett syndrome, uh, the, the prevalence of it is about one in 10,000 females. So it's not hard to find these individuals, and often they go misdiagnosed. Uh, or undiagnosed, I should say, but they're out there. Uh, it's a well-defined population. Like I said, we have good criteria for diagnosis. There's this single gene, MECP2, that's responsible in most cases. We have natural history study data now. The families are incredibly motivated. Uh, one of the things that got me involved in this is that the families really want physicians to become interested in this. They want them to help their children. And not only that, they, they have a lot of hope. Uh, they, they feel that if we do do this, then we can make a huge difference. And recently, uh, within the last 10 years, I would say, it's come to light that this is potentially reversible. So when I say it's reversible, what does that mean? Well, when we know what the gene is for a disorder, we can design an animal model for that disorder. And we've done that with mice where we give them the same mutation that the humans have. And we know from studying those mice, look, cutting them up and looking at their brains, that it's not a degenerative process. We know the same thing about other genes that cause autism. And if that genetic defect could be reversed early enough, then outcome could be excellent. Outcome in the mice was as follows. So that, some people in 2007 designed a really neat experiment where they gave the, uh, the mice a conditional knockout. So they were born without the gene. But the reason they were born without the gene is because the scientists had engineered a little switch into their genetic code. And the switch was turned off. 
and that switch was just before MECP2. So they could give a drug and flip the switch to on, and they would start expressing MECP2. The drug is tamoxifen. It's an estrogen receptor uh, that was the switch. And here's what happened. So they bred the mice with the mutation. Normally, this is what would happen to the mice. They would die. They would start dying around five weeks old, and then by 15 weeks, they would all be dead. When they gave them the tamoxifen at five weeks, half of them died immediately. <laughs> and there's two reasons why that could have happened. Either, you know, it's a, a chemotherapy, it's a poison, essentially. So that could have been part of it, but it could be also that turning on this, this gene all of a sudden is not a good thing. Curing someone of whatever disease they carry all of a sudden could have bad uh, ramifications. But the ones who didn't die lived. And not only that, all the other symptoms that the mice develop as they're dying that recapitulate the, the disorder, they went away, and they essentially became normal mice. Turns out, if they do the same thing in mice that are bred to live a little bit longer, they're expressing the phenotype as adults, the same thing happens. So <clears throat> they don't have to be ca uh, caught in the early stages of development. There's hope even for people who've carried the disease uh, through their, throughout their lives in adulthood. So we have a lot of challenges in our disorder. Uh, it is a rare disease. We have to fly around the country to find these people. Uh, we don't have good outcome measures specific for the patterns that, you know, of the, the hand wringing, et cetera, ways to measure these things. We don't have lab tests that we can do to test for these things. These are all challenges that we're working on. And as I showed you, function is very variable. Some of these kids are doing really poorly and some of them are doing well. It's an X-linked disorder. And MECP2 is a really interesting gene because whereas some genes code for proteins that do very specific things, they make up part of your skin or your eyeball or they make up receptors in your neurons that help your brain, your brain cells communicate, MECP2 is a manager, it's an administrator, and it governs lots of other genes, maybe 2,000 or 2,500 genes. We don't know how many yet. So affecting MECP2 affects lots and lots of other things. MECP2 itself turns on and off at, at different points in development. That's why the kids are doing so well up until a year or two, and then they regress. Uh, it also turns out that if you just give MECP2 for, to mice, for example, that having too much MECP2 is just as bad as having not enough. So it's a delicate balance. So what we've turned to is, rather than curing by addressing the gene, effect, addressing some of those assistant managers, the genes that MECP2 controls. And we can do that uh, with either specific drugs or other genes that we can administer. And so we've done that in some mice, and the mice, it turns out, get better. They might not be 100% better, but they get better. We've gotten to the stage now where we've tried this in some human clinical trials, and the biggest issue, of course, is that it doesn't always translate when a mouse is cured that the same effect will carry over to the human. So why am I up here talking to people at an autism conference about this? Well, there are a lot of similarities. So neurobiologically, the similarities are probably the most important. In both disorders, they're not degenerative, but they both have problems with neuronal maturation. The, the brains uh, are not matured to the same degree as in typical individuals. And this can be changed in various ways. But the point is that if something is found that helps individuals with Rett syndrome to mature those brain cells that are deficient, uh, then that may translate over into other disorders. The differences are really in the details, and they're not particularly consequential for translation of treatments, but uh, some of the things just to highlight are that individuals with autism generally have pretty good hand use, and of course the kids with Rett syndrome have terrible hand use. Some of this has to do with the fact that they're doing these repetitive hand movements all the time, though. 
kids with autism, some of them have seizures, some of them can have bad seizures, but that's rare. Kids with Rett syndrome, almost all of them have seizures at some point. So if you look across autism, uh, many of the causes of autism are other genetic disorders. So I think as a field, if scientists are of course interested in this, but it's important to look to models of the disorder that are not necessarily mice, but humans who have the disorder. And right now, there are clinical trials going on in some of these disorders uh, for disease-modifying treatments. There are some in Rett syndrome. Uh, tuberous sclerosis has some clinical trials going on now. If these work in these other disorders, again, 36% of the kids with TS have autism. So you're going to improve, hopefully, uh, the course of autism in that population. Does that mean that that would work in kids who have idiopathic autism? No one knows. So in Rett syndrome, just to give you an idea of how things have moved, maybe this predicts the future for autism in general, but in 66 when the disorder was described, between then and the 80s, no clinical trials were done. They were just trying to get the word out. Between the 80s and the 90s, one was done. Between the 90s and the 2000s, uh, there was, you know, the diagnostic criteria were available. Three, cl three clinical trials had been completed. Between the 2000s and our current decade, six clinical trials were completed. And that was in a period when the genetic diagnosis was available, the natural history study was going on, et cetera. So what's happened since 2010? It's not entirely clear. We've looked at a lot of different molecules and how they might affect uh, ret mice, et cetera. But 16 clinical trials in the last five years have been published or are in process. This is an explosion of clinical trials. So the future is obviously going to be exponential. And I assume that when other genes are identified that, that are causing autism or the polygenetic, uh, polyfactorial uh, mechanisms are ironed out, that this pattern will be the same. It takes a very long time, but once it takes off, uh, the progress is, is rapid. So obviously, coming back to this, the future is to try to turn an individual who has this type of uh, a pattern where they can't walk and use their hands into this type of an individual. This is that same girl in the beginning. Here she's in a Zumba class, which I don't know if I could do. Uh, and I do think it's possible. We see improvements even in these kids with extensive therapy. Therapy affects all the neurotransmitters in the brain. It changes the brain. And we see improvements. Uh, if we could find more definitive treatments uh, addressing the the underlying causes, the, those treatments could be profound, those improvements could be profound. Thank you.